You can have peace or you can have freedom. Don't ever count on having both at once. The story of how modern day Europe got shaped by its eventful past must have a starting point somewhere. Here at Battle Histories we like to tell that story by traveling past many of the historical clashes on the battlefields of Europe that happened between the peoples inhabiting this continent. This raises the question though, so where do you begin? We could go back all the way to the moment the first humans decide to venture beyond the continent of Africa and start our story from there. We do know after all that besides this first group who eventually ended up all the way in Australia, there was a second group that ventured to other directions which in the end brought them to Europe. We know that for tens of thousands of years humans have already been populating this European landscape. So what will be our starting point? From which battlefield will we venture through time and discover what shaped this part of the world? In the prologue we covered two battles from days long gone. The first one was a battle at a small farming village that once stood in the same place of the modern day town of Thalheim in Germany. The remains of this battle provided insight into the dealings between small tribes in Europe as far back as 5000 BCE. It showed that, even then, people were fighting for more control and influence over certain regions and fertile lands. There was no longer the need to only hunt and gather for food. Instead, settlements got created where groups of people could stay for longer periods of time. This claiming of the land definitely provided some friction between different settlements along the way. The second battle, covered in the prologue, was that of the Tollens Valley. This is the oldest large-scale battlefield in Europe known today. It showed us that even as far back as 1300 BCE, the inhabitants populating the dense forests of northern Europe had both the skills and the manpower to fight large-scale battles. Until the findings within the Tollens Valley, it was once thought that the closest place to Europe where battles of such magnitude took place in this time period was within the Middle East and northern Africa. The battles of Talheim and the Tollens Valley, however, are giving us a glimpse of what transpired in Europe in those last 5000 years BCE. But that's about it, just a glimpse. Furthermore, we know that during these years, different groups, tribes, villages and even cities are formed all over Europe. But any further information is still scarce. From around about the year 1000 BCE, we start to finally see some more concrete evidence of humans clashing on the field of battle in Europe. Most of this, however, is still a mixture of possible true events influenced by myths and legends passed down through generations. Hence the question remains, where do we start? Looking at the time period from around the year 1000 BCE and onwards, a logical starting point could be the Dorian invasion of Greece that started in the year 1104 BCE. This would suit our narrative if it weren't for the fact that this topic is still widely disputed by historians both in favor and against this idea. Although things were definitely stirring in the region that we know today as Greece, but not as much is known for sure. Staying in Greece, we could continue roughly another 300 years forwards to the first Messenian War, as another example. Now we are already talking about the year 743 BCE. And in doing so, we would only just skip past one other important event that happened just about 10 years earlier. We arrive in the year 753 BCE, while we move a bit further to the northwest and end up in a country that we know today as Italy. This period in history for both Greece and Italy is a mix of true events as well as myths and legends often used to simplify the historical accountings of what happened, as well as giving certain events a true heroic purpose. Legend has it that in the year 753 BCE, Rome was founded by the twin brothers Romulus and Remus. These twin brothers were said to have been the sons of Mars, the god of war. According to these stories, one day they were left to their own faith, floating in a basket on the river Tiber. They were abandoned by a king of the nearby Alba Longa and destined to eventually drown in the water. 
Though luck would have it that the she-wolf rescued them and the twins survived. When grown of age, wisdom and strength, they defeated the king that abandoned them and then founded their own city on the bank of the river Tiber. Although it sounds like a great origin story of the city of Rome, it is much more likely that it all started as many places once did. A small settlement on a location chosen for its strategic advantages. Rome found its ridges originally as being a crossing point of the river Tiber for salt trading. At this time, Rome was one of the many similar settlements on the Latium plain. It is believed that from the early days, when Rome's lust for expansionism started, at least seven different kings ruled the city into the ever larger growing city-state it initially became. The general consensus is that around the year 500 BCE, the seventh and last king was overthrown and Rome then moved forward as a republic. This however was still far from a problem for Romulus during his reign as the first king. Under the guidance of Romulus, Rome expanded and became more influential as a regional powerhouse within the confines of the Latian plain. This did not go unnoticed by the Fidenates, a people inhabiting the city of Fidenae which is located north of Rome. The people of Fidenae decided that there was only one countermeasure to these ideas of expansionism, and that was to invade the territories of Rome. Romulus in his turn felt that these invasions of his territory required a counterattack that hit the Fidenates directly at their home. During the campaigning season of that year, an army was gathered and marched towards the city of Fidenae. When arrived, Romulus set up camp just about two kilometers from the city gates. It was just far enough away whereby the inhabitants of the city were not able to see what exactly happened. The plan was to catch the defenders off guard by giving them the feeling that they would have the upper hand over the Romans. First, the army was divided into two different groups. The first group would be the main army and would go head on towards the city gates. The second group was sent off the main road and into the thickets. From here they would slowly but steadily move unseen towards the city. While Romulus approached the city gates with the bulk of his army, he even managed to give the defenders the idea that there was a form of disarray amongst his troops. This promptly led to the defenders opening the city gates and storm out in order to make use of their newfound advantage. In doing so, this would also negate the Romans any opportunity to besiege their city. As the two battle lines clash into each other, a signal is given and the second part of Romulus's army enters from out of the thickets. With the soldiers appearing as if from out of nowhere, the Fidenates are overwhelmed by what now turns out to be a much larger, but apparently also well-organized army. With the impact that this brings, the defenders are now shaking and decide to sound the retreat. Trying to flee back into the safety of their city, the Romans are hot on their heels. They don't give them one inch of breathing space as both armies stay bunched up. When the city gates are reached, Romulus gives the signal to keep pushing, which makes it impossible for the city gates to close. Once the Roman army got within the city walls, the battle for Fidenae was won. It is thought that after the victory of Rome over Fidenae, the latter was forced to become a colony of Rome. Hearing of the battle at Fidenae and the ruthlessness of the Romans, the city of Veii now also felt the threat of Rome. This was fueled by the fact that Fidenae was in close proximity to the city of Veii, as well as that both Fidenae and Veii were cities with inhabitants thought to be of Etruscan origin. Feeling that something had to be done, the army of Veii marched into Roman territory and laid waste to its countryside. While marching back with the spoils of war, the Romans followed them quickly and met the army of Veii just outside its city walls. There, Romulus managed another victory as the opponent routed back into the city. This time though, there was no possibility to perform the same tactic as before, and the Romans were not by strength to storm the city. Therefore, they returned the favor and in turn laid waste to the lands surrounding the city of Veii. 
In an effort to stop these warring cities from continuing, the peoples of Veii sued for peace with Rome by offering a part of their territory, and thus a hundred year treaty was agreed upon. Another part of Italy, occupied by the Sabines peoples, was also starting to get in conflict with Rome when still under the rule of Romulus. Here the reason for conflict was supposed to be the abduction of the Sabine women by the Romans. This story though heavily leans on its mythical nature instead of established facts. Nevertheless, the idea was that the Romans organized a festival to honor Neptune Equester in Rome and invited guests from nearby cities. They had tried in the past to approach other settlements and asked for their women to marry Romans, but this was not agreed upon as these settlements feared the ever-growing power of Rome. From Romulus' his point of view, he was worried by his city growing as fast as it did, but with a lack of female presence in relation to the amount of men, this would mean that a city with only a few newborns each year would most probably only last for one generation. Part of the guests that attended were a group of inhabitants from the region occupied by the Sabine peoples. At this moment in history, the freedom to choose was not as established as it is today, and therefore, when the signal was given, the party abruptly ended, as a group of around 30 females was captured while their husbands were fought off by the Romans. It is said that afterwards the Sabine peoples marched on Rome under the guidance of their king Titus Tatius in 752 BCE. They had managed, with the help from inside the city of Rome, to open the city gates and get their army inside. Initially, the Sabines seemed to have the upper hand. It was only after Romulus managed to muster more of his men in an organized battle formation that things started to turn slightly. With the battle now raging through the city and the bulk of both armies going head to head, according to the story, it was the Sabine women, those once abducted by Rome, that jumped into the middle of the battlefield. They pleaded for both kings to stop the battle, and that's what happened. From here on out, it was decided that the Kingdom of Rome and the Kingdom of Sabine would jointly rule both territories. This lasted for five years until the death of King Tatius of the Sabines, which now left Romulus once again as the sole ruler. After these eventful years under the rule of King Romulus, Rome had put itself on the map. The first step of expansion of its regional power and growing influence had started. The giant had awoken.